Deep in the gloom of these Scottish caves are messages from one of the most enigmatic peoples ever to live in Britain. This is just one of many symbols carved by the Picts, a people who so worried the Romans that they built Hadrian's Wall just to keep them out. But that's just part of these caves' colourful history. Over the centuries, Jacobite aristocracy, World War II refugees, even hermits have all sought shelter here. But now they're under threat. Rising sea levels mean it's only a matter of time before they succumb to the dark, cold Firth of Forth. And that's why we're here, to glean as much evidence as we can from these caves' rich past before it's too late. And we've got just three days to do it. The term Picts describes the people who lived in northern Scotland from the 4th to 9th century AD. Their name comes from the Latin Picti, meaning painted people, and they've fascinated historians and artists for centuries, despite leaving virtually no written history. The Picts' real legacy is their art, intriguing designs that have never been deciphered. And there's an unusually high number of them here in the Weems Caves on the very edge of the Pictish nation. We've got a stand here. Is that a Pictish name? Not as far as I know, no. No, that's not a Pictish name. But we do have some classic Pictish symbols here. This double disc symbol here is a classic one. What's this one in? Well, that's a salmon. Again, that's probably original. It's probably Pictish. And it's probably dates from perhaps about the 7th or 8th century AD. But this fish over here... What, what this one down here? That one there. It's quite different nature and character. And that's probably 19th century in date. We've got 1,500 years or more of carving straight in front of us here. This wall is a chronicle of centuries of human activity here. But we're going to concentrate on these mysterious symbols and the people who made them. The carvings represent years of Pictish presence at Weems, and we want to discover if this cave was a communal art gallery or if the Picts who left these marks actually lived here. If they did, we should find some evidence of occupation charcoal, animal bones, cereal grains and the like. But we're going to have our work cut out. The 1500 years of human activity here have featured periods of later occupation, industry and unfortunately vandalism, including one case when a car was driven into this cave and set alight. The technology and methods being used today are a bit more sophisticated. As part of an ongoing project implemented by Fife Council, the caves are now being digitally mapped. We're getting a scan of about five millimetre resolution here. Well, a, a point every five millimetres? Yeah. The laser scanning will create a high-definition 3D model of the caves, recording them for posterity. And once the well cave has been scanned, we're going to put in a couple of trenches for our own investigation. Oh, everyone, watch yourselves. It's really dark in here. Are you guys all right following through? Yeah. Cool. Oh. But over at the well cave, the laser scanning has finished and Bridge and Matt can now start work on the medieval period of Weems history. Oh, wow. wow. Look at that. It's awesome. <laughs> that is incredible. Our first trench in here will investigate the well that gave the cave its name. And in particular, Bridge will be looking for any evidence of medieval occupation, the period when hermits are believed to have lived here. Is this, this is the well in over here, right? Yeah, guess. this is the well over here. So the first trench is going to be around this? It's going to come straight out here, I guess about a metre extending from... Yeah. See the set stones here? Yep. All the way around. Set around the edge. The other intriguing aspect of the well cave is this tunnel, which, according to folklore, leads to the 15th century Macduff's castle, over 20 metres above our diggers. But in its current state, it doesn't look a particularly welcoming proposition. It's now down to Matt to try and find archaeological evidence of a medieval man-made passageway. We're going to put a trench sort of against that wall there, oh, halfway going, into it, yeah, and let's see, if we get it. let's see if we can get some evidence that people made that hole. You can see here the, the layers of rock, these sandstone layers, they're very soft. And as the, the sea pounds against it, it breaks little bits off along these joints here. And every bit it breaks off, it then 
bashes further against the rock and knocks another bit off. So you get this like, it's like a huge tumble dryer of pebbles and rocks going round and round and round and scouring into the rock. And if you look, you see just up there on that shelf, can you see there's a whole load of pebbles just there? Yeah, yeah. That, that's almost just a remnant of that last process of the <laughs> sea coming in here. Those pebbles are jammed into that rock, Give them a few more years, those pebbles would have brought down that ledge as they were swirled around, the cave would have got bigger. In Jonathan's cave, Mick has decided to open up another trench in the search for Pictish evidence. It would be nice if one of them gave us a result, if only. In Phil's trench, the expected two metres of archaeology with a nice Pictish floor at the bottom has spectacularly failed to materialise. Doesn't actually sound to me like evidence of Pictish habitation. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds to me like bedrock, Tony, and that's exactly what it is. We've basically got two layers. We've got a, a layer up to this dark line here. Can you see that dark yep. line mm -hmm. yep. across there? Now, we've actually got a piece of pot from around there which we think might actually be 17th century. No, I so in other words, that could be part of our Jacobite aristocracy yeah. that, we're, the, the, that we know lived in here. But above it, we've got... Gosh! <laughs> so what, what, what's happening here, then? Well, actually, this was, cave was once used as a, a nail-making ah, workshop. Yes. I mean, there is very, very little stratigraphy here. So does that mean the Picts who carved these things were extremely small? <laughs> It would seem that the Picts who created these designs came, carved and left again. There's no evidence that they lived here. Look, this is extraordinary. Yeah, mind your head tone. Yeah, well, it's like a mini cathedral. It's fantastic, in isn't it? It's like a proper cave should be. How have you been getting on? Oh, all right, we've got a couple of things going on here. Bridge is over there, look. Bridge, what have you got? Well, it looks like we're inside of the well here. Um, it, Tom's following round the curving edge. Inside it looks to be redeposited rubble, really, and we're finding crisp packets and paint tins. But he has just said that he's come down onto a new layer which does have some archaeological promise. Medieval chug handle, probably about 13th, 14th century. It's great. And that came from the lucid deposits up here, right next to the, uh, the, the tunnel opening. So that's pretty good for explaining a link between the castle up there and, uh, and this cave. They may be chucking rubbish down here or there's something joining up the two there, but I still want to get a camera down there, if, we, if possible. Yeah, but every single tunnel in the world, people say, it goes to the nearby yeah, castle. Yeah, a castle or a priory or a church. Yeah. Uh, maybe this one really does, you can't tell. Just a few years ago, this land surface went way out beyond us. I mean, this whole section of coast is so unstable. It's currently eroding at several metres a year. What would you expect to find in layers like this, on the beach like this? Well, I said, what I think we're dealing here is with a medieval midden. When I say a medieval midden... It's sort of dumped food remains. It's the rubbish from the kitchen. It's the old bones from the dinner table. We could actually find just about anything in this midden. We now want to find out what was happening out here and relate it to what was going on in the caves. In the sloping cave, Phil's search for Pictish occupation is starting to uncover a lot of bone, although it's too early to say what period it belongs to. And something else has been discovered in this cave, but this time it's not Pictish, and for once we can translate it. So what, what is that sort of Y-shaped, fork-shaped thing that we're looking at. It's a very distinctive Norse or Viking rune. Oh, crikey. But, I mean, is, is it what you'd expect to find in a cave like this? You expect to find anything. And we know that there was Norse activity in this area. Well, which letter is it? It's the letter K. It's the sixth letter in the <laughs> alphabet. And what's interesting is that um, the first six letters spell Futhuk, a, a sort of magical formula. It's oh, almost nice. as if I were to say uh, God bless you, or yeah. praise be to Allah, yeah. something like yeah. that. This is a timely reminder that these caves contain centuries of history. We're getting so much bone, and it's all from this level here. Yeah. The chances of that just being washed in, I reckon that has got to be... Too, like, too coincidental. Seat, too coincidental. Yeah. 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 I think we could argue we've got occupation here. Good. Good. Yeah, this is really loose. So it's probably fall. Yeah. This is more than just rockfall. These clean angular pieces of stone are debris from the construction of Macduff's castle in the 15th century. 
and that means anything directly below it will date to the same medieval period as the finds being uncovered inside the well cave. But what's more surprising is the bridge can't find any evidence of a water source for the well that gave this cave its name. That. Must be the natural. Back on the plateau, the archaeological evidence is now suggesting we're looking at a human presence here that stretches back well before even the earliest days of the Picts. If we begin at the beginning, yeah. and we begin with the wave-cut platform here... That's this smooth rock in front of us. That's right, that was cut by wave action, and we know from the geologists that that was cut about, from about six and a half thousand years ago. So that's Mesolithic. So that's hunter-gatherer period, when people are you know, not farming or anything like that? That's right, yeah. that's before farming. We've then got these midden deposits, and they've been churned about by the sea. We've got a lot of shell and, and sea sand in there. But we've also got a lot of animal bone, and some of this is domesticated animals. So that's telling us that it's Neolithic. So that's after hunter-gatherer period? That's after hunter-gatherers. So somewhere in this, there's a change from hunter-gatherer period to when people are actually farming. Well, yes, and that's right over the wave-cut platform. So if there was any Mesolithic, it's all been mixed up, and we can yeah. say that that lowest de deposit there is Neolithic or later. It would seem that almost as soon as this land and these caves were carved by the receding waters of the Forth, people were using them for shelter and farming. Coming out 41 centimetres from the section. Right. And then, then the slate around it. There's just too much archaeology in the trench, and some of it has to be recorded before it's removed. Okay. It's still got to be done precise, isn't it? Oh, of course it has. I mean, the, the fact is, you see, what we've done is we've got down onto this floor. This could... oh, where these stones are down Ah, there. no, no. This black stuff right at the bottom, that's right. the floor. Yeah. Now, see those big boulders and all yeah. have you? That's just a beach deposit, which is actually coming in. That's actually protecting the floor. Oh, right. it's, it's been marvellous. Yeah. But if you look at that level there, that floor, and you look at those carvings on the wall, yeah. cast your mind back to Jonathan's cave and, and how low those height, carvings were yeah. to the floor. Okay. So they could have been done by somebody sitting on that floor, in fact. Exactly. Yeah. That could well be the Pictish floor. Right. 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 If Phil's right, this would be the first evidence of Picts living in and not just visiting these caves. Are you nearly finished? Just Almost. about. I think we've just got it, yeah. Do we know how deep the well is? Well, I'm not sure if I'd want to call it a well anymore. I, I like the word pool a little bit. Yesterday, we dismissed the myth of a tunnel running up to the medieval castle. And now Bridge has discovered that the well that gave the well cave its name isn't, well, a well. A well suggests that you're actually tapping down into the ground to get water. But this seems to be an area where there's a natural accumulation of water. Um, and somebody has come along at some point and um, cut a bigger area to catch that water. If you can see here on the sides, quite sharp edges. And if you had a naturally formed pool, you'd have pebbles scouring round and round and round and round and you'd have quite vertical edges and they'd be quite flat. We don't have that here and it definitely looks like someone has been manipulating changing the sides. The amount of wear on the step and the effort that's gone into making this pool suggests this was a facility that was in use for a long time. It's very possible that hermits were the first people to take advantage of the rock face seeping water but the trench outside the well cave's entrance points to other, more practical people also living in this cave. And you can actually see in the bottom of this, this deposit, those have lines. You've got these very distinct marks, these linear dark features. These are plough marks which are going right yeah, I, I didn't here. dare to hope that's what they were. This neat bit of stratigraphy shows how much the plateau's changed in the last 600 years. At the top is a thick layer of Victorian landscaping below which are the rocks that were dumped here when the 15th century castle was built above the caves. 600 years ago, the entrance to the well cave would have been a much more welcoming prospect, and as well as providing refuge to hermits, it may also have once been home to the people who farmed the plateau throughout the Middle Ages. Cutting edge technology has digitally preserved the carved interiors, while the archaeology we've uncovered has told the story of a coastline that's had a brief but very eventful history. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites.
You don't get much more remote than this. Applecross is cut off from the rest of the Scottish mainland by a range of mountains. And yet this small piece of land seems to be awash with archaeology, potentially spanning thousands of years. What do you reckon you've got on this land? In theory, they tell us we've got a brock and uh, up here and uh, some Iron Age buildings, yeah. um, a stone circle, some agricultural cycle stones or equinox stones. And, uh, it's not bad amount <laughs> having your back garden. No, is not it? at all. I mean, you can't fail to notice that ridge, though. Yeah. Well, you can't miss it, and there's all sorts of things on the top if you wander across it, you know, odd earthworks and bits of stone and so on. So there's something up there. It's something like that, but, but you know, 1,500 years earlier. Well, a large posh stone tower sounds like a good place to start. And Mick hasn't wasted any time. In fact, he's already opened two trenches across the top of the ridge to look for the structure. Uh, this must yeah. be some kind of record for you. How come you hadn't seen the geophys, we hadn't oh. had the discussion even about what the thing was going to be, and there they are hacking away? Because if you look at the topography, you can see that we've got a great round, rounded flat top mound here. So this is the... The curve of it going yeah around and you see there. you yeah. get to somewhere yeah. like here and it starts to drop away and yeah. it's flat on the top so we've just put a, a trench across that to see if we're going to pick walls up within it and we've done the same over there we've got great big blocks of stonework so it's the, it's the old way before geophysics you see. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all looking rather promising yeah it is which it's scares good. the life out of me yeah. on day one <laughs> <laughs> And of course there is a problem. As we strip off the turf, it quickly becomes clear this is one of the stoniest landscapes we've ever done. Isn't this horrible to work? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Yay. Oh. Basically these are dry stone towers, there's no mortar or anything uh, involved. It's a big stone roundhouse, you've got a, a massively thick um, wall foundation. How tall would they have been? Best preserved ones today are up to about 13 metres in height. Now, not every brock would have been that high, but certainly up to that sort of level. And how did they build them that high? One of the keys to it really is that you have this uh, trick of building two concentric circular walls. Oh, it's not just one wall? No, no, you've got a corridor or a gallery that runs in between, and uh, basically the two walls then kind of lean in on each other. So why doesn't it just collapse? Really, it's the, it's the intricacy of the bonding of this dry stone. It's a fantastic level of achievement in dry stone masonry to actually build this thing. But the whole thing just kind of uh, holds itself together. So we need to keep digging to see if this circular structure has one wall or two. And at last, it seems that features are emerging from a sea of stones. Right. I mean, we're beginning to make some sort of sense of it, or we think we are. Right. We think that this might be either the inside or the outside of the wall. Right. You know, one edge of it, in other words. Yeah. And then possibly it looks like we've got some of these stones in here that are actually bedded in, then actually uh, interleaved and form the core of the wall. So, so I'm on top of the wall and you're on the outside there. You're, I'm on one, one edge of it, you're on the other edge, and, and through the middle is the actual core right. of the wall. I mean, it, it, it really is early days yet. But that's pretty good, isn't it, for, for, for just starting like that? Hello. Yeah. Phil's wall fits in rather nicely with John's geophys results and gives us a possible exterior wall line for the tower. We're now well into the afternoon of day one. It's beginning to get very wet and we've still got loads of other archaeology to investigate around Nick's campsite. But you seem to have some walls, don't you, coming across here? Yeah, it lo looks, uh, looks man-made, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I think we might clear that up and have a look at it later on. Because finds that we can reliably date are a rare commodity on Scottish Iron Age sites. The problem with the pottery here is that for millennia they just used the same local materials to make the pottery, so body shards aren't going to tell you whether it's Iron Age or Pictish or even much, much later, because making pot from local clays went on really right through the 17th, almost the 18th centuries in some places. Well, hopefully we'll have more luck with the big archaeology. Possibly these rectangular structures just outside the stone tower, where Mix decided to move some of our diggers. We can see what we think is the edge of the brock clearly. We can see bits of those structures, but we're not getting anything extra out of it. OK. But clearly we should do something across this, shouldn't we, Andy? I think we should open a long trench here, because um, 
it's not it's not that common to find external buildings outside the Brock in this part of the world. Right. If we're going to find them, they're going to be in this bit here. We can see that there are buildings here on the ridge. This trench won't just hit these rectangular features, but also the edge of our large circular structure. And as soon as we open it, we hit stone. But good stone, as in something that looks suspiciously like dry stone walling. This is looking like another face wall, isn't it, Alan? Yeah, well, it's in the right position on the slope. It's completely in, it's exactly the same stone with the same kind of wear on that side. Yeah. And if that wasn't enough, within minutes we find a second wall. Happy with that, Andy? More than happy. <laughs> I reckon three stones make a wall. Yep. Very short wall. Very <laughs> short wall. <laughs> What we're saying is the outer face over there. Have you got something? Well, it's looking, it's looking, like, looking like what? Suddenly, like we seem here. to be finding Lots walls everywhere. In Matt's trench, the brocologists think they've now sorted out what all these stones mean. You may conceivably have an inner face running along in here. In here, it's much looser, much smaller rubble than obviously in here, where you've got nice, packed, big, chunky stones. So conceivably, this is the inner face to go with our outer face. So we seem to have picked up in two places uh, elements of walling. So one of the places is over here somewhere? Oh, yeah. That's what? This bit here? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And if we can match that up with uh, what we've got around in the other trench, then we can begin to see if the walling is ref reflecting the overall shape of the mound that we're seeing topographically. So we're getting somewhere? We're getting somewhere. The only problem now is that the newly discovered outer walls in Matt and Bridget's trenches mean that the big solid wall in Phil's trench has got nothing to do with the tower. It's probably a later structure built of reused stone. Nick, I didn't know as many Brock experts existed no, not uh, did I. as I've found today <laughs> no, up the top no. of this hill. Yeah. So uh, why do they keep changing their minds as to precisely what's going on here? Well, I suppose what we've been doing is looking for an outer and inner wall and then inner and outer walls within that. And so every time we come across what looks like a line of stones, there's a, a, another suggestion that might be a passage, it might be a chamber. Then they clear the rubble away and it disappears. I have to say I was a bit nervous about this dig. I thought, well, it's either going to be a mound of rubble or it's going to be a brock, in, case, in which case we'll have solved it by the end of the day. It's not well, as easy as that. It's quite it's exciting, not isn't as it? easy as that. To qualify as one of these high-status brochs, the structure has to have two concentric outer walls with staircases and corridors in between them. And we found bits of wall in Matt and Bridges' trenches that suggest we could be looking at the footprint of a substantial tower. It's 18 metres in diameter. The walls in the trenches match exactly with the geophysics. That's a big structure up there. It's got to be a brock. Ian, tell us it's a brock. It's even more probably a brock than it was. Oh, Ian, <laughs> come on, mate. Don't what more it, do you need? I'll tell you what it is. It's the right size, it's the right shape. It's a big dry stone roundhouse, so we're in the right territory, definitely. But these brock-like things are pretty varied, and the real clincher is going to be back up on site in the new trench. If we can get two concentric walls for definite, then we've got a brock. We've closed Phil's trench, as it's now obviously outside the tower. And now he's extending Matt's trench, where we think we may have a corridor. Let's liberate some more dirt. And Bridges' trench is looking promising too. We've got the three stones that we got yesterday with the facing on this side. We're interpreting that at the moment as the external face of the external wall right. of this probable, possible brock feature. So it's sort of like the massive stones like we've got over there, aren't they, yeah. on, on, on the edge? They're yeah, very, they very big. Yeah, yeah, yeah quite yeah. similar. And then if you come to here, it looks like we've got good packing within a wall. Yeah. And then we thought yesterday we might have another face to the wall. What, where this line is across here? Yeah, we've got these three stones basically running straight up towards you, parallel to those ones there. The outer wall is substantial, well over a metre thick. 
But Bridge and Andy think they've also uncovered another similarly sized internal wall with a potential corridor running between them. What are you doing, Andy? Well, <clears throat> we think this is the outside of our Brock or roundhouse wall. Yeah. But you see this big stone here? Yeah. This is very similar to the ones that Bridget's been getting around in Hertrights, the big, very, very massive ones. Yeah. So we're really running out of room. So what we've recorded all this, it's all been planned. But I ideally want to try and have a look at in here now. So we're going to peel back to about here, remove all these stones. So you're going to lift all this stuff out? Well, I'm going to clear that one. Yeah. And Dougie here is going to clear that one. I think you've chosen the right bloke for the job. Yes. Come on, Dougie. <laughs> It's only when you see these stones being moved manually that you begin to get an idea just how massive an undertaking it would have been to build a stone tower that may well have been over 13 metres tall. It would have taken a colossal amount of effort to build one of these towers, which begs the question, what on earth was the point of them? Well, Raysan has a theory. Having experienced the bracing Scottish air, our resident architect feels a broch was a sophisticated building designed to defend its inhabitants against the elements. One thing that occurs to me is that this double skin is a response to thermals, how yeah. heat is used in the building. Mm -hmm. And if you have a central fire, the heat rises and you're getting convection currents, but you're drawing the cold air in through the cavity giving it a chance to warm before it actually enters the living space. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely, yeah. You'd have your central hearth either on the ground floor or more likely on the first floor. And exactly as you say, you know, the heat is being channeled around the walls. I mean, I think the other thing with the walls is that, you know, rainwater that's battering against the side of a, of a broch structure like this is allowed to uh, penetrate that outer wall. But then, of course, it encounters the cavity and it never makes that leap across to the inner wall. So that inner space stays dry, stays warm, basically protected from the elements. If only our diggers had some of that protection now, because if possible, the weather has taken a turn for the worse. And yet, surprisingly, we've made progress. This might be the, the foundation of the brock and the rest is gone. And these are actually maybe chalking or pinning stones to give the bigger stone stability before you actually dig it, if you like. Beginning of day three here in West Scotland, and those of us who aren't camping over in Applecross have to make this scary 18 mile mountain pass drive full of hairpin bends every morning, which is quite a way to get to work. But it, it really does bring it home to you that 2,000 years ago, the people who lived in Applecross would have been virtually unreachable. Unreachable, and as far as I can tell, soaked for most of the time. Our bedraggled diggers are already back on site and trying to unpick the stone tower at the heart of the settlement. And through the mud and stones, we're finally beginning to see recognisable archaeology. You see, you've got these big stones here, yeah. and they're in a nice uh, line, and they're all packed up against one another. And you've got this line running across there. Right. And in fact, you've got this big stone there, which is still on that line. And so what we're thinking is that this is the wall on this side, yeah. and that maybe that on that side is, is rubble. This wall line is the first example we've got of the internal face of the building in this trench. While over in her trench, Bridge is now convinced that she's got evidence that the tower consisted of a separate inner and outer wall. Look at this. Oh, this crikey. This is the most convincing solid wall I've seen on this site. Yeah, but well, that line there, certainly. So we've got this face along here. And then on the other side, we've got the white shell, which looks like this midden within the brock. And then we've got this packing here. So inside we've now it. got the inside wall, the outside wall, something in the middle on, in this trench and in that trench over there. So we can start drawing it in now, can't we? Yeah, absolutely working. That's brilliant. Yeah. And joining up all our discoveries so far gives us this. A structure 18 metres in diameter and constructed from two thick dry stone walls. But 
the work isn't over yet for our diggers, because if we want to be sure we've uncovered a rock, a uniquely Scottish Iron Age tower, then we need to find out what's going on between those walls. For a community rich and capable enough of building such a prestigious and physically impressive piece of architecture as our stone tower, I have to say this isolated piece of Scottish coastline seems a strange place to set up shop. Place it onto the, the 3D model. So this is the model that, from the GPS survey, so it just contours this top of the hill here. And I've placed a sort of reconstructed rock type feature, 4.6 metres wide walls, a couple of galleries. Is that the sort of thing you're expecting that yeah, side that, to be? That's looking nice. There, that's just, that's just perfect. And if that wasn't enough, just as the sun begins to break through, the space in between the walls has provided the clincher. I actually just found this piece of pottery um, in the gallery just over there, and it's actually probably dates the 2nd century BC to 1st century AD, so perfect for the, the date of Brock, so. Can we now say what the Iron Age structure was that we're currently standing on? It was a Brock. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd go along with that, it definitely is. Yep, it's a Brock, <laughs> no doubt. So why, what is the evidence that finally gave you the confidence to say it is a Brock? It's the structural evidence, really, you've got everything you could want. You've got the massive thick wall, you've got the galleries, it's very, very regular, it's the same all the way around. All of these things added together and it's a Brock. Well, that's a relief. Oh. These stairs would have led you into the very heart of the Brock. A warm, dry living area, protected from the extremes of weather, by a sophisticated architectural design. The Broch would have towered over this terrain, its mighty double walls defying the frequently harsh, hostile conditions of the western coast of Scotland. And yet no one can say for sure why it was built. But that hasn't stopped our team coming up with their own theories for this enigmatic building. Wherever you went in that community, whoever you were, you'd always see that tower. It's, always, it's, it's a sort of, it's a pillar of strength. That, uh, it's, it's, it's a some, sanctuary. It's a sanctuary. It's, it's, it's something which makes you feel secure. What you're saying with the Brock is, we've got the community here, we've got this area of land, it's ours. We can defend ourselves, we can defend our wives and children. You come raiding into us, we'll put our wives and children in here, and we'll come out with our swords, spears, whatever, and take you on. Basically, I think what they are are sort of very, very flashy monumental farmhouses where the uh, sort of local social elite are likely to have lived. It's a machine. The building works as a controlled atmosphere. And the more height you have, the more you can build in and get the temperature regulated, keep it hot all the time, or in the summer, if there is a summer here, you can cool <laughs> it off as well. I think the jury's out on what they're used for. I think, I, I think it changes throughout Scotland. You can't just have one picture of a brook. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Time Team get invited to all sorts of places these days, but they don't come any grander than this. This is Drumlanrig Castle near Dumfries in Scotland. But that's not for us. Typical Time Team, what we're interested in is something that's been discovered round the back in the garden. There's not much to see on the ground here, apart from a few lumps and bumps. But look, this photo was taken from the air during a particularly dry summer, and you see all these strange shapes and lines. The experts reckon these could be the remains of a Roman fort. If it is, it could have a really good story to tell, because it would have been in the front line of the Roman attempts to invade Scotland. Time Team have got just three days to solve this Roman mystery in what must be one of the largest back gardens in Scotland. Most Roman forts in Scotland were built of turf and timber and looked something like this, with big defensive ramparts and ditches, a gateway on each side, and buildings laid out to a set plan. In theory, Roman forts were meant to be the same, but they very rarely are. It's going to be a 10-metre long trench, and the first ever to be put in on this site. 
Trench 2, meanwhile, is going to test this geophys signal in what's thought to be the interior of the fort. Hopefully, it's going to give us our first look at one of the buildings inside. It's 11.20 and everyone's very excited, except me. I think probably the main reason I feel so sceptical is the one thing I know about Roman sites is that you get loads of pottery. But here, the only pottery anyone's ever stumbled on is one piece, this. Richard, where did you find it? I found it just behind us here, Tony, in the, the, the children's adventure playground. Did you realise that it was Roman? No, no, I didn't realise at all. We actually thought it was an old uh, gardener's pot. But you've got excited about it enough to want us to come here? Well, certainly, the, the site behind us, uh, it was discovered in 1984 through aerial survey, uh, and that's really all we know. You know, Roman camp, piece of pot, that's the story. This Roman pot dates to the second century AD, and it's our first clue to when this fort was occupied. But apparently our experts think it's likely that there was an earlier fort here as well, one that dates to the Romans' first attempt to conquer Scotland in the first century. Forty years after the Romans invaded in 43, the governor Agricola in the early 80s AD is bringing the Roman army right up into what we call Scotland, garrisoning it as he went and building roads. It sounds like it's going to be tricky to sort out, especially looking at the size of what I was calling Trench 2. Mick's strategy for the interior of the fort is to dig test pits. But you're not going to learn much from a trench as tiny as that, are you? All we're going to learn is what sort of deposits are in there and handfuls of pottery that give us some sort of date from it. Why here, John? Well, look, we've got the geophysics. There's the main road coming through. You can see it on our plot and the street's going off to the side. There's actually a road going across here. The main road there. So it's like that, isn't it? So we're in the yeah. corner and there, there should be a sort of building, yeah. maybe yeah. a barrack block. Uh, well, there ain't much of a barrack block there yet. Well, not yet. Just rubble. No, but if it was a timber building, you'd probably sit on rubble like yeah. that anyway, wouldn't you? Has it given you any clues so far? Well, we've got one or two bits of pot. Pot? This one, here, look. Well, that's doubled the amount of Roman pot they've had so far. <laughs> is this the same sort of age as uh, Richard's piece? Yeah, it's second century stuff. So it's it probably towards the end of the life of the fort. So there must be earlier stuff underneath. So you're going to keep going down here? Yeah, I mean, we're drawing it and recording it now, and then we'll go down and see what happens. Yeah. We've opened up another test bit over this geophys signal that could be the remains of a corner tower. Already it's turned up some pottery that again tells us something about life here in the second century AD. So we have some properly Roman pottery, a little jar rim, but this is coarse Iron Age style pottery. But it's not earlier than this material, it's contemporary with it. It looks as if, for the very coarsest, cheapest pottery, they're buying the ordinary pottery they can find in the locality. Buy it from the locals who are living yes. around, mm. presumably. Yes. So yeah, would the local so. people have been coming into a fort like this and, and blogging them stuff, or would they all have been the enemy? They'd certainly be coming in, because, of course, by the mid-second century, the frontier's moved north, it's on the Antonine Wall between Glasgow and Edinburgh, so this is within the Roman province, so the people here are beginning to go through the process of becoming part of a Romanised province, and there all kinds of supply and interaction is going to start taking place, yeah. Although I'm not keen on tiny trenches, this one, Trench 2, where I was helping yesterday, seems to have paid off and revealed traces of a wooden building. Matt, I believe you're the only one with finds trays that are filling up. Yeah, absolutely. What have you got? Well, we've come down into this trench onto this burnt layer, which looks like the destroyed building, and... Well, hang on, do you mean destroyed or demolished? Ah, well, there's the key question. I think it could well be demolished, because quite often these forts were raised to the ground by the soldiers as they left. That's exactly right, they cleared the whole place. And we're getting things such as the daub there from the walls, burnt clay. Right. And we even have some of these carbonised oh, yes. wattles. Yep. So that's the wood, the wood framing in which the clay was packed around. Yeah. So it looks like they knocked that down and then set fire to what was left over of it. Yep. yep. We, there are a few of these nails here, these large ones, and I presume they would have been holding oh, yes. the, the actual building frame together. And probably made in the fort itself, in the workshop. Right. Almost certainly, yeah. This little bit of metal. Oh, yes. I couldn't work out the end of a metal strap or something, but it didn't fit with the nails. And um, Well, there's an edge there. Do you see the corner yeah. there? Right, but it's covered in corrosion. It's just possible that it's a piece of scale armour, which is the sort of thing you might associate with auxiliary right. troops, but you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to say. All our evidence so far is building up a picture of the fort in the second century AD. We've got a wooden building with wattle and door walls, which, due to its position, we think may have been barracks. 
We're also digging up the remains of what's thought to be a much fancier building made of stone. Richard, apparently one of the really exciting consequences of you inviting us here is that we found the Principia right here. Although that's all I can tell you, because I've no idea what a Principia is. <laughs> it's the headquarters building, the main administrative centre of the fort, a very elaborate structure. And one of the big surprises we've had is that it seems to be built of stone. Now, that's something we weren't expecting. This looks like it's the Antonine, or the mid-2nd century, around 140 to 160 building. Have a look at this. At the moment, it just looks like rubble to me, but then Guy was expecting me to say that. We're in the courtyard. See this group of people here? Yeah. That's oh. roughly where we are. <laughs> we're, we're in the middle of a courtyard. What we've just seen where Kerry's digging over there... So where's that? ...is this front wall here. Yeah. So, just follow me. Yeah. If I run up here... Come on, Richard. <laughs> right, I'm now standing roughly at the entrance to that big hall, OK? So yeah. stay where you are. I'm now running round the hall, which is a little bit like a small parish church, up to here. Yeah. Round to the back. This is where the shrine is, where the unit standards and valuables are stored. Yeah. All, the, all the money, all the gold and silver possessions that some of the officers might have had. Yeah. Right the way up here, down to the end of the hall, passing rooms that may have contained all the paperwork that recorded the unit, and it's where the soldiers have been stationed, where they had to go, all their duties, that kind of thing. The end of the hall here. Now I'm moving out into the courtyard, so this is the big courtyard area where the commandant might speak to the officers of the unit, call in troops for disciplining or religious services. They had a whole religious calendar they had to follow, dedications to the emperor and everything. Come back to here, OK, and this is the front gate into the headquarters building, and I'm looking out through that, up through the road that leads through the north gate of the fort. Meanwhile, there's no way anyone would confuse this with one of our test pits. It's our 10-metre-long trench across the fort's defences. The news here is that Phil reckons he's found a couple of post holes. What do you think about that? Second post hole to one I had yesterday. Look, there it is. There's the one I've got now. And look, whacking it's massive, great post isn't it? hole there. Yeah. Phil's impressed by the sheer scale of the fortifications, but also intrigued to hear Guy's theory that they were probably never attacked. The Romans wanted to fight a particular type of war with their defences and they liked set-piece battles. But up here in Scotland, you've got various different tribes like the Votadini, the Selgovi, the Novantime. They don't want to fight that kind of war at all. They've got a much more... Uh, a much looser idea of fighting, and they're not really stupid enough most of the time to come and attack this sort of place. They want to wait out there by drawing the Romans out into the forests and marshes when they're out foraging for food or supplies or on the march, and operate a guerrilla warfare. So the fort would have looked great and be very impressive. But it's no use at all. Well, because the tribesmen weren't stupid enough to come up and attack this. I suppose it's a good way to spend your labour while you're up here, isn't it, really? Just build a fort, chaps. <laughs> There's nothing worse than a bored soldier or a bored archaeologist. <laughs> build archaeologist so back to it. Carry on, yeah. Yesterday we put in this trench to find the back wall of the second century headquarters building, which isn't clear to see on the Geophys plot. The news today is that it hasn't hit the building, but it has turned up lots of Roman finds. And is this what I think it is? Could that be a hobnail? Yes, it's got the big conical head and the, the curved over tail to it. I told you I wanted to see evidence <laughs> of one particular soldier, Mick. We, at last, we've got yeah. it. The finds are all coming from what seems to be a Roman midden or rubbish dump that was sealed under this cobbly layer. Both seem to date to the second century occupation of the fort. So there's actually quite a lot of archaeology in this trench. But we still want to see more of the headquarters building. Phil? Phil? So Phil's opened up another trench. Do you reckon that you're down on top of the headquarters? How the hell should I know that, Tony? I've only just opened the trench, we've only just cleaned it up. All right, well, can I ask you a different way? Why did you put in your trench here and not in the forest? That is a totally different question. Working from the principle of the known to the unknown, we've definitely, or we appear to definitely have the headquarters building there. Yeah. We think we've probably got the corner of it in here. It's quite patchy, this earth, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, this looks like the same destruction stuff we've had elsewhere of sort of charcoal and daub, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is massive burning, really big, heavy burning. But, but you know, like I say, we've only just opened the trench, yeah. Mick. Give me You're telling us to go away, aren't you, and leave you to get on I'm with it? I'm trying to be polite. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> see you. <it. laughs> Now that Phil's working here on the headquarters building, Bridget's in charge of finishing our dig across the fort's defences. 
Seven, eight, nine. It's about nine oh, metres. Good, isn't it? yes. She's trying to make sense of what's left of the nine metre wide rampart. Well, the problem with all these turf ramparts is, of course, none of them survive because they're fundamentally unstable. They rot and fall away. So all you've got left is what the Romans chose to leave behind. Now, these fragments of burnt wood are intriguing, and Guy reckons they were used to strengthen the rampart. So they use a series of timbers to frame it and hold it together as it tapers up to the walkway. So all you've got left are the bottom layers and perhaps some of the timbers, which is what those might be, that we use to lace the rampart to frame it. All right, Phil, where's your floor? That one there. Meanwhile, back in the trenches, we've opened up a few more test pits to help us work out the layout of the huge headquarters building that stretches across here. Phil, six centimetres different, so same floor again. Oh, that's very good. And the midden or rubbish pit we discovered here has got even more interesting. Not only has it produced lots more finds, such as Roman glass, but underneath it we've now revealed an earlier structure. What these look like, to me, is, is timbers, or the positions of timbers that have rotted away. That's exactly is, right. Is that what you'd think yeah. these were? These are earth fast timbers, um, framed together, pegged and jointed together. Um, supporting a superstructure but firmly bedded in, in the ground, floorboards over the top. Right, so we're looking at an earlier <laughs> phase of Roman timber buildings, barrack blocks or whatever they are. Yes it is, um, it certainly predates the metal surface that we're on, Yeah. Um, but the pottery that came out of it was all second century, so it's part of a, the, the second major phase of the site. So there could still be an earlier phase of fort underneath? Absolutely, yes. So even though we've found two different layers inside the fort, they both seem to relate to the second century occupation of the site. We're talking about a period of something like 20 years, long enough for turf and timber structures to need repairing or replacing as needs changed. And in the absence of any dating evidence in the bottom of this three metre defensive ditch, the feeling is that the two phases of ramparts we've unearthed both probably date to the second century too. It looks like any evidence of a first century fort, if it's here, will be buried too deep for us to find. Yesterday, you were the one who said you wanted to work outside the fort to see if you could find any evidence of anything really early. How have you done? Well, the thing I was really excited about was this little d ditch here, it forms like a triangle. There's, there's the fort and it seemed to sit on the outside of it. And what I was really interested to know was whether it came on, is it part of an annex coming along here or whatever. So we asked the geophysics to do this area down here. Geophys have surveyed this area, but they can't find any continuation of the ditch, leaving Stuart to conclude that the annex could be shaped like this. But what's an annex for? Um, we don't know a huge amount about annexes. We think that they could have been there and they could have held things like um, animals that might have been related to the fort or possibly an industrial activity that they didn't want to take place inside the fort. Late first century. Gordon reckons this shape could be really significant. He thinks it's identical to an annex found at a fort at Strakathko. Snap. <laughs> there you are. That's the crop mark at Strakathro. This is the crop mark at Drumlanrig. The little triangular area and the continuation that Stuart was talking about is the equivalent of, shall we say, that area there. Mm. Here is the annex, just the same shape, although four times bigger than Drumlanrig, and here is the corner of the fort and its side to which it's attached at Strakathro. Exact parallel. Strakathko is classified as a definite first century site, and Gordon now thinks that this could be proof of the same early occupation at Drumlanrig. Is what you're saying that the best evidence for first century activity is this annex? That's is that right. what you're saying? That, uh, in terms of structure, yes, at the moment. So you found something really good and you didn't even know. Oh, great! <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was so excited. <laughs> Geophys's completed survey has revealed lots more buried archaeology for the experts to think about, and it can now be studied against our 3D model of the site. But most importantly, what the Geophys plot has given us is a much clearer idea about the layout of the second century fort. We can put on the, um, the ramparts and the ditches. Now, we know about those, obviously, and um, Phil's dug the trench right the way through it, so we've got a pretty good idea of that. Now, we've got the headquarters building, which Kerry and the others have been opening the trenches up across, so we know that building's there, and it's pretty clear from the geophysics. Now that's the nodal point, if you like, and from this everything else um, pans off. So we can put in the other buildings according to the geophysics. That's very good, isn't it? Yeah. You can really see those in the geophysics. So there's the barracks, probably for the infantry. 
There's our headquarters building. I put granaries here and our commandant's house, but to be honest, we really can't be certain about exactly where those were on this fort. More barracks here, perhaps for a cavalry contingent, if there was one here. We end up, therefore, with roughly 480 infantry and possibly 120 cavalry at the end. Standard Roman unit. Guy may be right, because it looks like there were definitely some cavalry here. So if one of the trenches behind you... This is really exciting. This is so Roman Imperial <laughs> cavalry. Really? Yeah. Uh, it can only work in a limited number of places on the harness. Um, as you can see, the main harnessing on the saddle itself, which stops the saddle from either moving forwards or backwards, um, has these fittings. Right. So it's more likely to be perhaps here, Mm -hmm. or on a brow band, somewhere where it's going to be more or less permanently in place. Line of them polished up, they'd look fantastic, as, as all of this harness does. But for a Roman site, we've had relatively few finds. I really expected there to be bucket loads of stuff. Well, there are bucket loads of finds around here. They're just not on the fort because the Roman army did its housework when it packed right. up. It right. didn't leave the stuff around for the enemy or for anybody else. It cleared away the fort and all the archaeology we produced just suggests that this is a very complicated site with a lot of occupation, several occupation layers in a very tight date range, but neatly cleared away every time. And in most cases, we haven't gone into those uh, layers of archaeology. We've just come down onto the top of them. Which is precisely what we've done on our second century headquarters building in several trenches. Finally, what can we say about it? We didn't know whether this was a dividing wall or the back wall of the main building. This is of the headquarters building? The headquarters, right, yeah. Right. There might have been a room coming this way. Right. So we put this trench in, Yeah. and all we've got is this road surface. That's all we could see on the geophysics. But there might be something in this gap, might there? There might be something, but come and look at Phil's trench. <laughs> I've cracked it. I've cracked it. it. <laughs> we've actually got all the components in here. We've got the main road and it actually stops here. And the reason it stops is that it's butting up against the back of the, the main wall. It's difficult to see because the stone walls have been robbed away. But as I understand it, Phil's located the massive back wall of the building and inside it, evidence of a room with a wooden partition wall and the trace of what might be a dais or raised floor. It's likely that this was the Chapel of the Standards, the room at the heart of the headquarters where they kept items such as a bronze Draco and the other valuables. And as we found lots of evidence of burning within this huge building, it seems likely that the Roman soldiers set fire to the headquarters just as they did to the wooden buildings, before leaving Western Scotland for the last time and withdrawing to Hadrian's Wall around 160 AD. We've yep. got it, we've cracked it. And all the result of the GF is. <laughs> Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more. <laughs>